ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يدلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما آتاكم الرسول فخذوه وما نهاكم عنه فانتهوا صدق الله العظيم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لسان يفقه قولي درشي فالله Respected brothers, respected elders, mothers and sisters listening at home. Sayyidina Uthman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala adn is that blessed soul who was given the glad tidings of Jannah on numerous occasions. Not just once, but many times in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explicitly the words of Jannah came out from the auspicious mouth of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for this incredible individual the son-in-law of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Uthman bin Affan and inshallah ta'ala tonight we will try to cover some of those blessed moments in which the Basharat the glad tidings of Jannah was given to him one very interesting event has been mentioned in the books of Ahadith when the companions the Muhajir companions from Makkah to Mukarrama migrated to Medina to Munawwara in the beginning it was difficult for them to settle in Medina al Munawwara, a new city, a new environment, to take up residence in any new city at times it's quite difficult. And so for the Muhajir companions it was quite difficult also. These were people for generations who had settled in the blessed city of Makkah al Mukarramah. Now we need to understand though Makkah and Medina are both situated and located in the Arabian Peninsula but even weather-wise there is a tremendous difference between Makkah and Medina to Munawwara. The summer of Makkah is different to the summer of Medina to Munawwara or the heat of Makkah is different to the heat of Medina to Munawwara and the winter of Makkah is also different from the winter of Medina to Munawwara. A lot of difference. And so it was taking a bit of time for the companions to adjust. But the main difficulty was with water. Water is something that is very very important. Now for the Muhajirin who came from Makkah, in Makkah water was plentiful. You had, mashallah, the well of Zamzam sweet water that was accessible for them any time but in Medina to Munawwara for the Ansari companions it was okay but for the Muhajireen it became very difficult nothing would suit their stomach and therefore water became uh, a difficult moment for the companions the Muhajireen what to do and some of the scholars have mentioned that when Allah's Nabi with the companions migrated to Medina to Munawwara, at that time in Medina to Munawwara, the only water, sweet water that was accessible was from the well of Roma. That is why Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, often what he did, 
during his stay in Madinatul Munawwara, ulama have mentioned that there are at least 17 wells in Madinatul Munawwara from which Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam drank water. And not only did he drink water to make it sweet, what he did was that he mixed the water of the well with his auspicious saliva. But we are talking about the initial stages right in the beginning when the companions came. It was very, very difficult for the Muhajir companions. Now this Bire Roma, the well of Roma, belonged to a Jewish man. Now in the beginning, of course, relationship, not only just in the beginning, but throughout the stay of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Madinatul Munawwara, that is when he first encountered the Jewish community. The relationship was very, very unstable. It was like treading on thin ice filled with hostility. The Jewish people were not accepting, especially the Muhajireen who came. And one of the fundamental reasons for that was the crushing defeat that uh, the Mushrikeen of Makkah had received in the Battle of Badr. This was an immense humiliation for the Jewish people also in Madinatul Murawara because the Jews were close allies of Abu Sufyan in Makkah. So crushing the army of Abu Sufyan actually meant defeating even the Jews in Madinatul Munawwara. Now Abu Sufyan was the main player. He was the man who would mobilize all of the military campaigns against the Muslims. And they did not let the Muslims settle all the time, even in Madinatul Munawwara, threats. Threats from all the sides. From Makkah to Mukarramah, the Mushrikeen were preparing to attack and on one side the Muslims had to watch their backs because of the Munafikeen and also the Jewish communities that had settled in Madinatul Munawwara. So the relationship was very, very unstable. In fact, any opportunity a Jewish man was given to tie a noose around the necks of the Muslimin, they would not miss that opportunity. They would take the full advantage to make life miserable for the Muhajireen, especially in Madinatul Munawwara. And at times this enmity became even visible when Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decided to confront them and to speak to them one to one. One uh, incident that had taken place in Suke Banu Qaynuqa. Now the Jews of Madinatul Munawwara were holding this monopoly with all the goods that came into Madinatul Munawwara. So they had their own bazaar. Souk means bazaar. And Banu Qaynuqa were a very powerful tribe. These were the wealthiest from amongst all of the Jewish tribes in Madinatul Munawwara and those who hated the Muslims the most. These were the people who held the most grudge against the Muslimin. Very strong, powerful people, business minded people. And look at the courage of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All alone he decided to go and speak to them and give them da'wah. And give them da'wah. All alone, Allahu Akbar. No one was with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thought that let me open the doors of Islam for them to call them and invite them to Islam. Possibly the best location is Suke Banu Qaynuqa, the bazaar, the marketplace of the Jewish tribe Banu Qaynuqa. All of the people are there and Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered their marketplace. When they saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were shocked that this man has got the courage to come to us and subhanallah, Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had all the courage. This was, in fact, uh, a very important feature in all of the Prophets, Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam, and especially Hazrat Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so he gathered them and he said to them that I am the Nabi after Musa. My name is mentioned in your scriptures. I am the Nabi after Isa alayhi salam. What is so difficult for you in accepting me? Worship one Allah and continue the message and follow 
the, the line of the prophets that are even mentioned in your scriptures. Allahu Akbar, not only did they reject the call of Islam, but when Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started to speak to them, they were making a mockery out of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, shouting at him and verbal abuse. People were screaming from all the sides so that no one would hear the words of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And some of the leaders came and in a very harsh manner they spoke to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they said to him, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't be, don't feel very confident just because you have defeated the mushrikeen of Makkah in the battle of Badr that you will defeat us. We are not like the Arabs of Makkah. We are the Jewish race, the Jewish people. We have a lot of wealth, we have a lot of manpower and we have weapons and we will not shy off from waging a war against you. If an opportunity comes, we will fight you. Takabbur, arrogance, uh, this haughtiness that was in them. I was listening to the radio a few days ago. Uh, it's all about Mr. Obama now, the new president of America. Subhanallah, they talk about this black man who's become the, the president from, for America. But uh, people fail to realize Hazrat Bilal radiallahu ta'ala an. Right in the beginning, in the time of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was given the honor to climb the roof of the Kaaba and to give azan. When you talk about taking off, taking out any uh, cells, cancerous cells of racism, what better can there be for the Muslimin uh, than the seerah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And how Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dealt with racism. And that is why when we even stand for salah, we have to stand shoulder to shoulder. No matter who that person is close to you, be it black, brown, white, whoever, rich, poor, anybody, everyone together. And when you go for hajj, put on two towels, white towels. King or a peasant, everyone is equal in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nevertheless, they were describing him as the most powerful man on the face of this earth. They were describing him, that's Barack Obama, that he is the most powerful man on the face of this earth. What powerful, my respected brother? The man who said, Ana Rabbukum al A'la Fir'aun for 350 years, he did not suffer from a headache. But when he saw the Adab of Allah, he said, Al Ahana, now I believe in the Rabb of Musa and the Rabb of Harun alayhi salam. Subhanallah. And when people speak in that tone and in those words with haughtiness, then my respected brothers, the downfall is imminent. Then the downfall is imminent. This is Sunnatullah, this is the nature, this is the tartib, the pattern of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these were arrogant people. <coughs> they did not even understand Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how to communicate with him. And subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in quick succession dealt with them. Anyone who disrespects Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has to be very careful. Scholars have mentioned an incident had taken place just a few months after this da'wah that was given to them by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Again, it is so important that we understand that the true mission that was given to the Prophets, Anbiya alayhim salatu was salam, is to give da'wah to the non-Muslims. What is it, my respected brothers? To give da'wah to the non-Muslims. Alhamdulillah, we have groups of Muslimin who do da'wah to the Muslims and to the non-Muslims. Alhamdulillah, we must remind each other of the good works, even to the Muslims and even to the non-Muslims. But nowadays we must really be focusing on giving da'wah to the non-Muslims. Who knows? Maybe you explain some of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to your colleague, to your friend, and that might be a, a turning point for that individual and he might become a Muslim. Who knows?
Subhanallah. Because hidayat is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't give hidayat. But yes, we have an immense responsibility on our shoulders. Allah says, Kuntum khayra ummatin. You are the best ummah. Ukhrijat lin nas. And Allah has taken you out for all of mankind. Kya farma? Lin nasi. For all of mankind. Ta'muruna bil ma'aruf wa tanhawna anil munkar. And you invite them to Islam. And they will, inshaAllah, embrace Islam. So this is our fundamental duty. This is not the job just of an alim. That it is the, the responsibility of scholars or the likes of Ahmad Didat and the likes of other individuals to promote Islam. No, no. Every man can do da'wah to his own capacity. Insha'Allah ta'ala. And so, the incident that had taken place is that one simple Muslim lady entered their marketplace and some of the youth of the Jewish tribe Banu Kainuka ganged up on her and tied her hands. And when they tied her hands, in doing so, what had happened, it had exposed her aura. It had exposed her aura. Aura means satar. That part of the woman's body which should be concealed, which should be concealed, especially from unrelated men. Especially from unrelated men, who we know as the ghair maharim. And so she started screaming. For them it was a joke. For them it was all a joke. An Arab woman who came, a sahabiya, and this is what they want to do. But subhanallah, the companions were brave soldiers. Huh? Brave soldiers. One sahabi heard the cry of a lady, and he came running into the marketplace. And when he saw that one Jewish man was trying to touch her, subhanallah, immediately he actually killed that Jewish man. He killed him. And now, when the Jewish tribe saw that one of their man has been killed, all of them ganged up onto this one Sahabi, and eventually he also became a shaheed. So he was martyred. Now, when this news was given to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all their bragging that, oh, we will fight you, and we are not like the people of Makkah, Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam immediately called all of the Muslimin and he said that let us go and fight the tribe of Banu Qaynuqa and a siege was laid it is said for 15 days they stayed inside their fort and after 15 days all of them surrendered 750 strong men of the Jewish tribe surrendered to the Muslimin and Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had decided that all of them should be killed. What did he say? What did he decide? A Nabi of Allah, that all of them should be killed. 750 of them. But then, the munafiq of the time, who was pretending to be a Muslim, whose name was Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul, he lived in Madinatul Munawwara. Remember, this man was to be crowned as a king before the coming of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But when Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came, all the attention was diverted to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And all of the Ansar and the Arabs accepted Hazrat Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as their leader. And so everything in Madinatul Munawwara was under the control of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what he decided was the best thing for him to do was to join the Muslimin. But to pretend that he is a Muslim, but in his heart there was kufr. So these were the seeds of munafiqeen that had already started and penetrated amongst the Muslimin, the so-called Muslimin. And alhamdulillah, the list of all the munafiqeen was already given to Hazrat Huzaifa radiallahu ta'ala. So he, start, he came and he started crying to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa Ya Rasulullah, give them, allow them a safe passage out of Madinatul Munawwara. This is the best option. You can't kill 750 of them all together and give them amnesty, allow them to go. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked at Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul thinking that again there was a group of munafikeen with him. A group that were influenced by Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul. Maybe if Allah's Nabi gave him some recognition, possibly his followers might embrace Islam. Possibly 
his followers might embrace Islam. And so it was a give and take situation. Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decided, Khair, what I will do is I will tell them to leave Madinatul Munawwara and to move out. I will banish them out from the Arabian Peninsula. And all 750 took all of their whatever their belongings were and moved towards Syria. So this was the doing of Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul. And the reason why I have mentioned this is just to give you a picture that the relationship with the Jewish community in Madinatul Munawwara was not very strong. In fact, very unstable. The Muslims did not want a good relationship with the Jewish people because the Jewish tribes, you couldn't trust them. And the Jewish community were not accepting the Muhajir companions of Makkatul Mukarrama. And so now this well in Madinatul Munawwara belonged to who? To a Jewish man. This person again was a very shrewd man. He knew that the Muslims wanted water, especially the Muhajireen. And the only well that supplied sweet water was his well, Bire Roma. Now again, Roma was the name of a Jewish man who had once own this well. So that is where you get the name Bire Roma. But ulama, subhanallah al have explained a lot of history with this well. And they say even before this Jewish man, this well was originally uh, dug by um, the king of Yemen many centuries back. The king of Yemen was passing in the valley of Aqiq. The valley of Aqiq is part of Madinatul Munawwara. Now, this man was very pious. It was his habit that he would only travel with the scholars, with the ulama. When you study Islamic history, you will find that so many of the Muslim kings would only have ulama as those that would advise them. Many ulama. Subhanallah al And even... If you look at Harun Rashid, what a pious man he was. Harun Rashid, a very pious man. The taqwa that he had attained was actually due to the barakat of Imam Abu Yusuf. Imam Abu Yusuf was the student of Imam Abu Hanifa. And Imam Abu Yusuf was appointed as a chief justice during the time of Harun Rashid. And Imam Abu Yusuf had played a tremendous role in influencing Harun Rashid and molding him towards piety and taqwa. So this is just one example. But if you see, subhanallah, a lot of the kings were very, very pious in Islam and the reason for that was because they would, they were always in the company of ulama. Today, it's the complete opposite. You have the fusaq and the fujjar who don't have any understanding of Islam. Subhanallah I recall when Maulana Yusuf Ludhianwi, the great mufti of Pakistan, um, what a great scholar he is. I'm not sure if some of you have heard of his name, Maulana Yusuf Ludhianwi. And a lot of his articles were always written in the daily Jung newspaper of Pakistan. From, Pakistan, from Karachi, he went to Afghanistan to visit at that time the Taliban were people who were the rulers and the Taliban gave him so much respect as an alim so much respect that the minute he descended from the plane like you have a red carpet for uh, VIP and leaders and presidents that come and ambassadors they had a thick rug that was unfolded for him from the plane until the Kah. This was for Morana, Yusuf, Ludhianvi. A lot of respect. A lot of respect was given to him. Subhanallah. And history shows that when Muslimin and the kings have respected those who have knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also opened up the doors of Islam. So generally you will find a lot of the people, they would have a lot of attachment with the pious people. So this man, the king of Yemen, again even today Yemeni people are very pious people. It is said about Yemeni people 
that a lot of them don't pray five times a day, but they, they pray six times a day. They treat tahajjud salah as a far salah. They treat tahajjud salah as a far salah. And Yemeni people have a lot of knowledge. A lot of the people will go to Yemen again just for knowledge. So this man was King Tubba and he traveled with a group of scholars. And he had actually stopped in the valley of Akik, which is part of Medina to Munawwara. When he stopped camped there, all of the scholars were with him. The ulama that were with him looked at the valley of Akik and they said to him that if you give us permission, we want to stay in this valley of Akik. So the king of Yemen said, why do you want to stay here? We are just passing by and we are travelers. And they said, no, we have information, we are scholars. According to the scriptures in which that city has been described for the last Nabi to migrate, that city fits the complete description of this valley of Akik. So we want to stay and settle in this area, the valley of Akik. He was a pious man and immediately he said to them that I give you permission. Not only did he give permission, but he stayed there for many months and he actually, with, his, with, with the army and the men that he had, he built uh, homes for all of the scholars and he donated a house to every alim that was there. And it is said that in the middle he had built a beautiful mansion and he said to them, this mansion, this house is a gift to the last Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the king of Yemen. And so he made wasiyah. And scholars have mentioned that when Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to Medina to Munawwara and the, the camel of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stopped at the house of Abu Ayyub Ansari, that Abu Ayyub Ansari's house is actually the house that was built by the king of Yemen for Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Abu Ayyub Ansari is from the children of those scholars that had settled in the valley of Akik. So realistically speaking, Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not the mehman, the guest of Abu Ayyub Ansari. Allah's Nabi actually had settled in his own house that was gifted to him from the king of Yemen. And what this man actually did was also, he dug up a well so that sweet water was accessible for the scholars that were now taking up residence in this valley of Akik. Historians, Muslim historians have mentioned that this well that was dug up is actually Bire Roma that later on came into the possession of the Jewish tribe. So originally this well, Bire Roma, belonged to this Yemeni king. And what he did is that he had made it work for the scholars that were there. And then it was taken again by the tribes, the Jewish settlers in Madinatul Munawwara. Subhanallah al-Azim. Now the difficulty was water. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam understood and he called all of the companions in Madinatul Munawwara and Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man hafara Roma falahul jannah. Man hafara Roma falahul jannah. Anyone who digs up the well of Roma, for him it is Jannah. Muhaddisin have mentioned digging up Roma does not mean a new well. The hadith, as explained, means that anyone who makes the well of Roma waqf for the Muslimin, for him it is Jannah. Now, Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu ta'ala an was a man of great repute and respect well known for his art, articulate skills, the way he would speak and that is why he was appointed as the Khalifa of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the treaty of Hudaybiyah and he took it upon himself that inshallah I will make sure that this well is given to the Muslimin as waqf so he went to this Jewish man who was the owner of that well now this Jewish man was a very shrewd man, what he did he knew that the Muslims were desperate, so he had built a fence around the well, a fence around it, and secured it with this very strong door. So no one was allowed to come and to drink from that water, from that well of Roma. Hazrat Uthman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala came to him. He was a businessman, 
and said to him that I am prepared to buy this well of yours and I will give you any amount of money that you want any amount of money that you want think about this Hazrat Uthman is offering him a blank check any amount that you want cash dinar dirhams I will give it to you but you sell it to me Allahu Akbar this was Uthman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala to please Allah and his Rasul Allahu Akbar they would sacrifice everything that Allah had given them and the more sacrifice you do the more Allah gives you and this man was very stubborn he said to Uthman bin Affan la I am not interested I don't want your blank check I am not interested this is a, a priceless asset and this man was going to exploit with the situation and he knew that the Muslims are desperate for water I don't want to sell it but now you have to understand that Uthman bin Affan knew also the sickness that was in the Jewish community which is Hubbud dunya he must be sweating when he said I don't want your black check, blank check because they have this intense love of dunya as well Dunya is everything for them. And so that Uthman said to him, Look, I have come here and I will not leave empty handed. You have to compromise with me. So he is saying to Uthman, You better stand up and go. I don't want to sell. Hazrat Uthman said, No, no, that is not how you talk to me. I want to compromise with you. So Hazrat Uthman had done his homework. He says, You don't want any amount what I am offering you today. Any amount. He said no. And then Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala an made a second proposal to him. He said look. Even a better option is. That I give you the money any amount that you want. And also that well of water, that well of Roma belongs to you. The well of Roma belongs to you. I give you the money and the well also belongs to you. So he said, what do you mean? That you give me money and that well also belongs to me? Hazrat Usman says, what I am saying is that give me 50% of that well, the well of Roma, and I will give you a blank check, whatever you want. So he said, how can I give you 50% of the well that I have? Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala an explained to him that for one day from sunset to sunset, the well, the water that is in the well belongs to me. Whoever I give permission to can benefit from the water that is in your well. And the next day this well belongs to you and you can stop and restrict whoever you want. So 50% of it belongs to me and 50 to you. But realistically, <coughs> you still have that ownership of the well and I am giving you money. Now this man said, oh, subhanallah. You know, it's money coming. Huh? And Usman radiallahu ta'ala answered, what is the price? And he said that, he started saying, five, no, 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 ten, no, fifteen, no, twenty-five thousand, no, thirty, no, no. And he said, thirty-five thousand dirhams for a well. Now, my respected brothers, thirty-five thousand dirhams in those days for a well, you would be considered as a man who's insane to pay that price for a well. A man who is insane. Maybe he has no aqal to pay that much for a well. Hazrat Uthman radiallahu ta'ala immediately gave him 35,000 dirhams to him. And said, here's the money. 50% now of the well belongs to me. Agreed. Subhanallah, he stood up. And this is how you do business, my respected brothers. This is how you do business. He stood up and made an announcement to the Muslimin that when it's my turn all of the Muslimin and he said not only the Muslims even the non-Muslims it is free for them to use this well of Roma and use the water however they want even the Jews were taking benefit from the well of Roma during the turn of Hazrat Uthman radiallahu ta'ala now what Sahaba Ikiram Ajma'een were doing is that during the turn of Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala they would take 
two, twice the days, twice the day supply, and so that it would help them for the next day. Now, they would queue up, the animals were there, people were taking, mashallah, a lot of water back home, and the next day when it was time for that Jewish man, he would look at the well and see that the water is very, very less. It was a problem. And in fact, some have said this was the karamat of Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala, that on the day of Hazrat Usman, the water was gushing up. Gushing up. And when it was the turn of that Jewish man, there was no water. Eventually this man, the Jewish man, got so angry that he said that, is there anyone else who wants to buy the well, the other share of this well? No one actually had the money. And he again invited Hazrat Uthman bin Affan. Hazrat Uthman bin Affan came and he said, I'm pleading to you now, why don't you buy the other share and this well is yours. Hazrat Uthman was a businessman. And this time Hazrat Usman only gave him 8,000 dirhams. 8,000 dirhams. And mashallah with 8,000 dirhams, Bire Roma was now work for the Muslims. I'm not sure if any one of you have had an opportunity to drink from the water of Roma. Anyone here? They've closed it, but before it was open. Anybody here? No? Alhamdulillah, I have had an opportunity to be there. There were some uh, patans that were there. Now it's sealed. But before it was quite open and it was, there was a fence around it. And you could go inside. It, they had actually made it like, like a pool that was there. But uh, originally the well is inside. And even today that, that water is still there. I'm not sure now. I think uh, it's completely sealed. But subhanallah, sweet water... And when Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was informed, Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came and he drank from this well of Ruma. And from then on, this well was no longer named as Bire Roma, but it was called Bire Osman. What was it called? Bire Osman. So it is actually Bire Osman, not Bire Roma. And Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked at Osman and lifted up his hands and made dua for him, taking the name of Hazrat Usman. And Allah's Nabi said, Ya Allah, give Usman immediate entry into Jannah. Give Usman immediate entry into Jannah. Allahu Akbar. On numerous occasions, uh, Jannah was given to Usman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala. Allahu Akbar. Now, mashallah, respected brothers, I won't take much of your time. But a very important lesson that we should learn from this uh, story mentioned is that Allah has blessed us with wealth today. But we should channel it in the right direction. Allah has given us a lot of wealth. And at times what happens is that uh, we don't make the right use of the money that is given us, given to us. In fact, what we feel that oh, they are the rich amongst the Muslims and it is their duty to do the works. And somehow we are exempted. Somehow we are exempted. None of us are exempted. Alhamdulillah, living in this country, you have an opportunity, my respected brothers. And at times, with wealth, you can please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a bonus. This is an additional blessing that Allah gives an individual. We don't realize that. Marhum... Muhammad Sidat, Marhum Muhammad Bhai Sidat, was a good friend, mashallah, a man who also worked very hard for this masjid, but uh, very senior in age, but very close. Allah gave him Jannah. Amen. Often he would sit and he would speak to me and he says, Maulana, help me, I want to make my investment in the hereafter. So when I die, I have done this, I have done this, I want to do this. And is this the right way? Is this right in Sharia? So if I die, will I be getting the reward? MashaAllah. Is there, is my bridge connected from my grave to, from my dunya to my grave to Jannah? Huh? Subhanallah. And the way he would speak, it was as if this man, Subhanallah, even whilst alive, he was just worried about the hereafter. So these were really individuals who've done a lot. They sat with the scholars and said, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to do. Is this according to the Sharia? A lot can be done, my respected brothers, we don't realize. 
We don't have to wake up for tahajjud. We don't have to read a lot of siparas of the Qur'an. In fact, if money is with you, you can do a lot. Very quickly, just to explain to you one hadith. In the hadith, Allah's Nabi, in the hadith actually, Sahabai Kiram Ajma'in came to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they said to him, ذَهَبَ أَهْلُ الدُّثُورِ بِالْأُجُورِ That the rich amongst the companions have overtaken the poor companions. And this was a complaint to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were complaining to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah's Nabi said, how? And they said, يَسُومُونَ كَمَا نَسُومُ They fast like how we fast. يُسَلُّونَ كَمَا نُسَلِّي They pray salah like how we pray salah. But the difference is, وَيَتَصَدَّقُونَ بِفُزُولِ أَمْوَالِهِمْ Because Allah has given them wealth, they do sadaqah, and we haven't got wealth, so we can't do sadaqah, and so they have overtaken us. This was the gham that the, the companions had. Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took all of the poor companions on one side, and he said, let me say something to you. Sadaqah is not only with money. Sadaqah is not only with money. You want to compete with them? And he said, Subhanallah is Sadaqah. Alhamdulillah is Sadaqah. Allahu Akbar is Sadaqah. And Allah's Nabi even said, fulfilling your conjugal rights with your wife is also Sadaqah. Some of the companions say, Ya Rasulullah, isn't this fulfilling your, your passion and desire? Allah's Nabi said that if you were to fulfill your desire, uh, with a woman that was not lawful for you, wouldn't that be a sin? And they said, of course that would be zina and a sin. So he said, so if you do it in the right manner, Allah will reward you. So if you do it in the right manner, Allah will reward you. An explanation was given that sadaqah has a very broad meaning to it. So there are different methods that you can even choose and inshallah you could compete with the rich Companions, so Sahabai Kiram Ajmain were very happy, and this was a group, and they were not prepared to open up to the rich, but somehow this information leaked to the rich companions, <laughs> and the rich companions understood. Acha, so ye baat ho rahi. Now even they started doing Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, and all all that which was explained, they started even doing it. And then the Sahaba came again, Ya Rasulullah, now they are doing the same thing what we are doing. At the end, Allah's Nabi said, look, ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ الله. This is the fuzzle of Allah. This is the distribution of Allah. يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ yasha. He gives to whom He wills. He gives to whom He wills. So this is what I'm saying, my respected brothers. Everyone here, Allah has given us wealth. Everyone here. We all have wealth as compared to the others uh, suffering out there. Allah has given us a lot of wealth. Before we die, let us study that what we have done for the hereafter. What is our sadqa ijariya? That is very, very important, my respected brothers. Look at Sahabai Kiram Ajma'in. Subhanallah. Imam Bukhari. Just today, I was explaining to the children hadith. I said, look at this sadqa ijariya. Uh, centuries have passed. Uh, since the death of Imam Bukhari rahmatullah alayh. But every child and every man benefits from Bukhari. Every man. Imagine the sadqa jariya, the reward that he is receiving in his grave. What a work that he has done. Here, fazail amal Hazrat Sheikh Zakaria has written. So what we have to do as individuals in our own capacity to open up a vent, a window, that, insha'Allah, which will be a means for sadqa ijariya for us, and it will benefit us in the hereafter. Nowadays, there is no guarantee, my respected brothers, that when we die, who will stand on our qabr to pray? There is no guarantee. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq. Wa akhiru da'wana. And alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina wa maulana Muhammadin bin umi wa ala alihi wa salli taslima. Allahumma taqabbal minna wa tuba alayna inna kanta tawabur rahim. Sami'ina wa ta'ana gufranaka rabbana wa ilayka al-masir. Bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin.